What's going on, everyone? Welcome to this week's episode of Can I Kick It FC. I'm your host, as always, Elliot Barr, and joining me is a man that uh, collectively thought AFCON is the, probably the craziest tournament outside of CONCACAF. Nah, AFCON is crazier. Yeah. 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 I- <laughs> AFCON is about survival. It's not about talent. It's not about tactics. It's survival. It's truly, yo, it truly is like CONCACAF. Like, and I think only people that have experienced CONCACAF will love AFCON. Yeah, I feel like. Because the thing with CONCACAF is, other than the U.S. and Mexico, it is kind of one of those where it's those two, but then you have this next level. And even then, you can see like a Jamaica or Canada. You can see them lose to a Trinidad and Tobago. Like, it wouldn't surprise anyone if Honduras gets a win. It wouldn't surprise anyone if Panama gets a win. Hell, you can even start dropping down. Maybe hate, I mean, and World Cup qualifying, Haiti was close to knocking out Canada. Like, they were pretty it was getting pretty slim getting into the i don't know if it was the gold cup qualifying or conca cap but there was a point where haiti had canada on the ropes and even olympic qualifying was kind of the same way so it is one of those where once you start and i think a lot of it is just because unlike in europe and south america and even asia the terrain and the environment is just so different than what most players are probably at least most of the top players are accustomed to no, yeah. Um, so obviously, we're not going to do like a super in depth breakdown of AFCON. There's way better podcasts that are dedicated to this. One of those podcasts, African Five Aside. Um, I can't remember the guy who creates it, but I listen to it literally every day after AFCON. <clears throat> and it is, it is amazing. It is like a 30 minute breakdown. But one of the things he said when he was doing the team preview was, A lot of people, a lot of teams are going to try to bring in European players for the technical piece. But he said that the teams that are going to win are the teams that know how to grit and grind their way to results. And that's literally all that call was. Like The the tournament winner pretty much was the epitome of just get by until the final. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, like if this is any other tournament, Ivory Coast doesn't even make it out of their group. We're talking about them getting what shellacked on the last day of the group stage by what was it, four goals to Equatorial yep. Guinea? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. And they lost four zero to Equatorial Guinea. They get in because they're like one of the best third place teams, and then f- fire their coach <laughs> in the middle of a tournament, something we have never seen before. And then go on this run to the final and win it. And the thing with Ivory Coast was just more like, and even when he got to the knockouts, it was still them just getting by. Like they barely got by Molly. Like it took a 90th minute equalizer and then another goal in stoppage time um, for like that was in the round of 16. Then you get to the round of, then you get to the quarterfinal. Once again, oh, sorry, Molly was the quarterfinal. The round of 16 was Senegal on penalties. Mm-hmm. And that one, they got an 86 minute penalty from Kessie. <laughs> so it's just one of those where you get there and it's like, okay, they get by the round of 16 on penalties. They barely, they somehow miraculously get through in the quarterfinal. They get to the um, semifinal, play DR Congo, get a goal in the 65th minute. And it's just, again, scraping by probably should have advanced and then it gets to the final and completely were dominated Nigeria. Yeah. Now, and this is the thing that is crazy. 
Ivory Coast, the only reason why they got in over Ghana is because of a win. Like they had worse goal difference, all this. Like <laughs> literally, Ivory Coast got in because they won the first day. Yep. That, that's 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 crazy. But the, the other thing about Africa to show you how crazy this tournament was is like, I think it was three out of the four teams that were third place team went on to make it to the quarterfinals. And of course, yeah, like Ivory Coast goes on to make it to the final win, but they meet Molly in the round in the quarterfinals, and that game goes to extra time. Like <laughs> it just shows you, like, yo, it, it's really it is just like gritting, grinding your way to a win and get it out there. Like, well, I'll say, I, even I wanna... all the other matches were kind of the same way. Like, there were a few of them where, I mean, Angola did completely control against Nami- Nami- ah, Namibia. I cannot say it, but yeah. I'm not struggling. But, you know, they had like Nigeria <laughs> handled Cameroon, but all the other, and like South Africa handled Morocco, but everything else like Cape Verde and Mauritania, 1 0. Guinea, Equatorial Guinea, 1 0. DR Congo, Egypt, penalties. We mentioned Senegal and Ivory Coast. Mali, Burkina Faso, 2 1. And it's just one, and even Cape Verde and South Africa in the quarterfinal, in the worst penalty shootout you will ever see. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was they, bad. It, it was the that was game. bad. That was not good. That was not good. That was not good, man. I mean, when the penalty think, winner, when, when the penalty shootout is one to two, <laughs> it's not I think good. there was like a sick part of me that was rooted. Like y'all want to get the goalkeeper PKs, but I wanted to be like one to two. Like I wanted to be absolutely horrible. Like if we go be bad, be bad. Like they that's what I wanted. They they held their end of the bargain. They did. They did. Man. Oh, all right. I feel like we can look at this Africa through two premises. And I feel like a lot of people are looking through the premises of the big teams failed. But the premise that I'm kind of looking at is, is like, yo, like the smaller or not smaller, I should say, but lesser known countries thrived in this tournament. Like absolutely thrive. But let's start off with the big teams that failed. I think the one we should obviously start off with, um, let's start. I know we, you're probably praying that his hamstring's okay, but Mo Salah in Egypt. It, Egypt was weird because that group was just Cape Verde won, won two games and drew. Egypt drew all three of their games, and when you yeah. look at the games they drew, they were all kind of the same thing. Where it's just, yeah, they they did what they needed to. All of them were two two, which was weird. Like Mozambique, Ghana, and Cape Verde all were two two. But it was all different ways, whether it was kind of getting late goals. And I think the thing with Egypt was it's just Egypt is a team where they can either make a deep run like they did in 2022 um, for that tournament, or they just completely look like a shell of themselves. And I think a lot of it yeah. and losing Mo Salah did not help. And had they if he was healthy, maybe they would have gotten through the round of 16. But even then, it's like, that's not even a guarantee. So I think with his hamstring, it was also one of those where they're saying, you know, if they get to the final, he would have played, or if they get to the semifinal. But I don't know. I don't know. It was very hit or miss in that regards. But I think with Egypt, it was just kind of a, it is kind of an older squad if you really look at it. Like a lot of these yeah. guys are like El Neni and Mo Salah, kind of like the two main ones. Like they're in their 30s. Like this is they probably still have another AFCON left in them, but we're kind of seeing that older squad, like a squad that is a little bit older that maybe just don't have as much of the legs as they used to. Yeah. I, I think like one of the things that was really, I talked about before this tournament for Mo Salah was like, he hasn't won an AFCON yet. Like I, I, I made it to a point about for Mo Salah about how, it was kind of like Egypt viewed him as like second place. Like he wasn't the main guy in Egypt. Like they loved him, they adore him, mm-hmm. but he wasn't like he has the one after for it. It's kind of like Messi in Argentina. Like he does all these great things for club, he hasn't done it for country yet. Even though like getting to start World Cup is great and all that stuff. Like he got to win Afcon. Like Afcon is our World Cup. He got to win it. And I I think my thing that is most confused is just the way how the whole thing was handled. Because it was like Egypt was saying, oh, Mo Salah is hurt, but he's going to return. And Liverpool is like, well, he's hurt. Let's bring him back to Liverpool to get him evaluated. And then Jurgen Klopp made his statement. And then Mo Salah's agent made his statement. And it was like you had 
it was kind of like everyone was kind of looking out for themselves and most yep. didn't say anything, so it made it more confusing. And that's what I was going to say. Like, that was kind of the main thing was yeah. everyone, because each of them have a vested interest for that. Like, for Liverpool, it is your best player. You want him healthy, especially now that they are competing for four trophies. You need him, like, you need him to come back ready to go so that he's heard, like, you know what? just get fully healthy egypt has this tournament that they want to win so then you have this and the agent is probably just like look i need my guy to be healthy because if he's healthy and especially considering every transfer one i'm sure we're going to hear about saudi arabia like a saudi club wanting to bring in mosala it's kind of like he's got to make sure mo's at his peak as well so i think it in most not really one to go to the media and kind of say like what's going on either so that doesn't help um that case as well so i think it yeah it was everyone looking out for their best interests at the same time it's kind of like because yeah liverpool were like oh he'll train in liverpool get re do his rehab there if egypt makes the final then he'll go over there it's like that doesn't make sense but I, yeah. uh, but then you look at it, it's like well it makes sense if he's going to do that so that better facilities better state-of-the-art care you're going to have that's kind of the mindset of it yeah, and I think another Egypt and Mosala have that weird relationship as well. Like, there, it is kind of just one of those where <laughs> they expect so much out of him because he is one of the best players in the world. But at the same time, as we see, like, he can only do so much. Like, you can't really expect, like, he can only carry the squad as far as it can go. Yeah. No, that's true. And you made a good point about how he's just kind of like they kind of get out of phase. It kind of reminds me of like South Korea as well. Like yep. a lot of their best talent starting to get phased out. And you know, what does that rebuild look like? I think another team that kind of well, not kind of, they're really disappointed, Ghana. Like, you got Muhammad Kudus, you got all these stars. And the thing is, like, Kudus start rise to this tournament. Like, I from my kind of rec my recollection. He did not play a bad game. Like, the, the tournament really was not on him. I think it was more so was on the former manager, which was a weird appointment. <laughs> but it, it just was a choice. Like Ghana, yeah, it was. It was. It just kind of seemed like Ghana was just more or less going through the motions at this point. But it was also just one of those where they had games that they should have. Like, they should have won the game against Egypt. That was the one game that they played relatively well and just dropped the ball there. Then they go and have another match. And it's one of those, again, where it's kind of like, you got to beat Mozambique. Like, you got to go, you got to get that. You need to win that to keep chances alive. And you blow a 2-0 lead with a 91st-minute penalty and then a 94th-minute equalizer. Yeah, Like, you had it. You had it had it and then you let that happen and the thing though is though Mozambique outplayed Ghana but it was just Ghana got the two goals that they need that from AU both penalties ironic that he makes the penalties um <laughs> you had like they had it and that's the thing with Ghana it was one of those where, like if they were just they couldn't play a full 90 minutes it was always just it felt like there was just some disconnect because against Cape Verde, I think they allowed a stoppage time winner as well. Yeah. So it was just like yeah, they couldn't no, no, play 90 full minutes. Yeah. I felt like that's another thing too about this tournament. Like so many goals happen like after the 85th minute that changed the course of these games. You know? Yeah. Like I, I, I don't know for certain, but I feel like AFCON adapted the same rule that the Premier League did in which – if like if they're they just accumulate all the stoppages, right? Because normally before like most games you get like three, four, like five minutes was crazy, six minutes was wild, and now it's kind of like you're getting adjusted to see 10, 11, 12 extra minutes, and a lot of these teams are like bunker back, sitting back, and it's like yo, y'all do realize y'all got to defend for like another ten minutes like this, right? <laughs> Why do that? It's like, Why do, you do that? <laughs> it is like no one caught on to that point. It was just like, oh, you got you got to defend. Like, oh, okay. Um. So another team that you know I picked to do well in Afcon. Uh, we'll talk about them together. Algeria and Tunisia. I think both yeah. 
to me, these are the two most disappointing teams of AFCON. I, I would say Algeria was the most disappointing team of AFCON. If I had to rank, it was Algeria, yeah. Tunisia, Zangana. Yeah, I, I would go. I would go Tunisia because I had them going to like I thought like it was a good it was a good balance why they could get through. And watching the games, none of that. Like they just looked. I don't know. They they did not look like they wanted to be there. Algeria. It looked like a team that needed a refresh, and it just ain't started yet. I think that's another that I think Algeria is one where it is kind of the same as Egypt, where it's like you have one guy right now in Riyad Mahrez. You're putting a lot on him. You can only do so much. And I, but the thing with Algeria though is there other there are young players that are very, very good that should be helping. Like mm-hmm. Benasser should be helping out like yes they have Riyad Mars but it kind of felt like they were relying more on him but then you have Benacer you have Hassam R you have um does it's a defender and I'm drawing a blank on his name Ait Nuri over at Wolf at Wolves like you have guys where you should be better and I don't know what and I don't know what happened with them it kind of just felt like things just like the tactics got stale or like I can tell you Again, what happened. It was give the ball to Mirrorize, get out the way, and let him do everything. That's literally what it was. Like, I, and it just, it's like teams know that. Like, teams know you're going to give the Mirrorize to do something. Like, you got to have at least a plan B, plan C. Like, if you're going to play counter and defend, you got to defend. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another, they're another one where it's like they were leading against Angola most of the time allow an equal a late equalizer not as late as some of the other ones but got the late equalizer barely yeah. got through Burkina Faso they needed a late blast so like a stoppage time equalizer so it's just another one of those where you kind of look and it's like you there's no reason you shouldn't have you should have done better but again this is Afghan so that also goes out the, that logic goes out the window yeah no it very much does and today's the like what was it one goal scored and two goals given up like it just yep just lack of bite on attack. They couldn't string good attacks together. They looked just very slow and lethargic. So, yeah. Um, the way I have to shift it to a positive, though, is I think the thing about this AFCON that caught so many people's attention was the amount of lesser-known nations that went on, like, these massive ones or, you know, getting picking up great wins. Like, if we start mm-hmm. off in Group A, right? Like, Equatorial Guinea is in a group with Nigeria, Ivory Coast, and and um, Guinea uh, Bess- Guinea Bissau. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Guinea Bissau. There we go. All right. And I think, and look, if you would have gave most people, like, all right, I want you to pick the winner of this group. They're normally going to pick Nigeria or Ivory Coast, right? No one had Equatorial Guinea, you know, especially not with leading the group in goal score with nine. And that's the thing. They scored nine goals, which is absurd. Yeah. Put a four on Ivory Coast and four on Guinea Bissau. And and drew with Nigeria. Like that was the thing. We were all like, oh. Oh, they're good. <laughs> yeah. That was one where you it was like, okay, equalize against Nigeria. It's like, okay, that's this is and everyone's like looking at Nigeria like, oh, this is just that's not good enough, Nigeria. Then they score four goals against Guinea Bissau. And again, you're thinking, okay, Guinea Bissau, not as strong. It's fine. But yeah. the 4 0 on Ivory Coast, that was when it was just, that was the big eyebrow raiser because it's like, you're doing this to the host nation in a game that the host nation has to win, or at least like they need a positive result to keep the, yeah. at the time we thought to keep their hopes. And the fact that they just went in and just, thoroughly outplayed them and just dominated them. It was just that was a big eyebrow raise. And then you even get to the knockouts with Guinea Bissau and then um no not Guinea Bissau, sorry. With <laughs> I'm taking wrong wrong Guinea. Wrong Guinea. With Equatorial Guinea and it was a lot of Guineas. It was a lot of Guineas. And then they just could not seem to find it against Guinea and lose one zero. Yeah. <laughs> Granted uh, and Guinea scored in the 90th minute. <laughs> I feel like that's when the tournament started, all in the ninth minute. Between Cape Verde and Angola, I feel like those two teams 
Like, it, there's always like a team in the tournament that doesn't win that, but it, it captures the public's like love mm-hmm. between Cape Verde and Angola. And I was I was for Angola early. Between those two teams, I think they captured everyone's love, especially like baby. Like everyone was like, "Is that baby? Like man, you hate it, baby." <laughs> It's like, yeah, that's <laughs> I think it was interesting because with Cape Verde, it was another team that was just able to score a lot of goals. You know, scored mm-hmm. two, they scored seven in the group stage, which was, and they only allowed three. So it's not as though they're just playing loose and just high score. It was, they were defensively solid. And we even saw in the match against South Africa in the quarterfinal, they created so many chances against South Africa. They, should oh, yeah. have scored at least two or three goals and just it's just it, they just lost all that clinical edge to them and i was gonna say nine out of ten times if they replay that game and everything else happens they still finish one of those chances so cape verde was definitely a team where they had a style that you just wanted to keep watching because they're creating all these chances and then with angola it was just more of the like a lot of these guys it's kind of more of the relative unknown it, you know, it's not as though, like, there's not that many players that you're looking at the roster and like, oh, I've heard of this guy. Like, I remember this guy. It was kind of like, oh, he, you know, some play in Turkey, some play in Angola, some play in Portugal, but it's not like they're playing for the top teams in Portugal. It's, so you're looking at the squad and you're like, oh, okay, this guy, this guy's doing the work. Like, otherwise, it's kind of, and that's the beauty of AFCON. It's like you have a country like Angola. And no, they don't have, you know, the top European stars that you have heard of, but they have enough yeah. cohesion that it allows the tactics to work. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a cool thing. I mean, like, the other thing, too, like, I forgot to point out. And by the way, I got to mix up. I said Molly was a third-place team. I meant um, Guinea. They were the third-place team, not Molly. Yeah, Guinea <laughs> barely got through as the third-place team as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the thing, I meant to break this up. Equatorial Guinea, top goal scorer, Emilio Nusi. Nusi. Nusi? I don't want to believe that's true. Is a right back by trade for his club. 34 year olds played for Inner City in Spain. Played striker for Equatorial Guinea. Was the top goal scorer with five goals. If that doesn't eclipse all the craziness and wonderfulness of AFCON, I don't know. That's like. I don't know. That's like Barbados taking a USL League One center back. You know what? Better example, and you're gonna love this. That's like um I don't what's the center back y'all had at Ford Madison. Josiah Trimmingham, center back. Yeah. That's like <laughs> going up like top him. for a striker. <laughs> that's like him going to Trinidad and Tobago. And they're like, Hey, you go play striker. And then he's the top scorer at AFCON. I mean at Gold Cup. At the Gold Cup. <laughs> it is like Oh my God, yo! Can you imagine soccer toward this collective meltdown if that was to happen? And oh if you look at the top goal scorers for Afcon, it's like you got Nusi again, right back at by trade. You got Mustafa Mohammed, where yeah. he, like he plays at Nantes now. So like, okay, at least he's got some. At least you've heard, he's at a club that most people have heard. Of. You got Gelson Dalla, and then you still got like other than like. Adamola Lookman, again, you're not looking at somebody. And Bert, like the Bertrand Triore, Ad, Adamola Lookman, now you're starting to see names you recognize. But when you think about it, in terms of two goals, Kudas had two. Jordan Ayu had two. Okay. Frank Kessie had two. Um, Holler had two. And then he just looked like. Hey, Mo he Salah. scored the most important goal. That's all that mattered. I was going to say, he, he scored the goal that they needed to score. <laughs> but then you look at. He did what he needed to do. But then you're looking at all these other guys like, okay, Mo Salah had one goal. Uh, Trezeguet, one goal. Saudi Almane, one goal. Uh, Hakimi, one goal. It's just you look up and down. It's like, oh, there's a lot of guys that did not score as many. I think Oshiman only had one goal. And yeah. he just said they're like, really? You, you, you would think there would, there would be more, but I don't know. No, it's it's hard to explain, but I think like I, I think the best way I, I I can explain it was this wasn't a tournament built on stars, you no. know, like for prime example, like the Euros, right? I can guarantee you, 
Harry Kane is going to be in the top five of goal scorers, right? But that's not the case in AFCON, right? Like, it's not a star thing. Like, the big teams are, aren't are guaranteed to make it to the round of 16 in this tournament because, like we said, like, these teams, these lesser known nations are knocking off these big nations, right? Like, and also, I want to say, like, I think a lot of the craziness from this is coming because this term is happening in the middle of the season, right? Yeah. Like, a lot of these guys are coming from Europe. I'm not saying they want to be there. They are not do or don't want to be there. But it's also like, you know, like, I could be in London right now. <laughs> you know? So maybe some of that. But, yeah, I, I think – just the upset factor this tournament. And it's weird because you didn't have that many upsets. If you go look at Asian Cup, you didn't have too much craziness within the groups. Like it's kind of like the groups was like a, a sleep through. But like other the, than South Korea, groups, like South Korea is the one that was South Korea is almost emulating Ivory Coast. And that was kind of that was the only that was it. Yeah. And South Korea was creating a lot of their own craziness. But I think the thing about like Afcon that captured so many of our attention was just like every game kind of became must watch because it had its own set of craziness. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't remember the game, but I can remember it perfectly. The guy who, he hand Paul the balls in the back of the day and celebrated it for everyone. And it was shameless celebration. There was not any. And he just, he swore. I think it was, I think it was um, Cameroon and Gambia, I think. Oh, I think so. Yes. And he, the, thing, the thing that made it so funny was he went to go celebrate with the ref. As if, like, you ain't see that. <laughs> he like, so, and it, yo, and it was just like, I'll never forget the motion. And this man just stretching his hand out like this. Like, he just punching it into the back of the net. I thought we wouldn't notice. <laughs> they really, he really thought that we weren't going to see that. <laughs> he really thought uh, that VAR was not going to catch that. No, but it's like that is the funniest thing in the world, man, to me. Because it's just like, I think, mean, like that's also another thing that that makes this tournament so great is like the passion of it. Like mm -hmm. we saw it in the stands, like. To me, watching this, it was a well attended tournament. You know, I, I can't speak about other Afcons in the past, but this was one where it was like you kind of felt the atmosphere from like kickoff. Like, oh, stop. I see the supporters, I see the fans, like everyone's kind of in and out of it. And even like old players are coming back, like Didier Drugba, Samuel Eto. I mean, I know Eto got to be there for a reason, but right. yeah, like, <laughs> he got to be there. He don't got to do it. Um, but no, it, it was just great to see, you know, all these legends come back and support it and whatnot. Well, the one thing that I think really stood out to me with this tournament was how well, like, there was no reffing controversy and how VAR was it. They, this is the thing I always say with VAR. VAR itself is not the problem. It's how it's being used. And you see that in the Premier League where it's just like, yeah. we don't understand why they make these decisions despite having this evidence. And in AFCON, that wasn't the case. You know, there was times where they would call a penalty and you were like, that's not a penalty. They would review it. Yes, it's not a penalty. You look at the handball, it's blatant. They thankfully got that call correct. But like there wasn't any refereeing controversy, which I think is very that's huge because then it takes out that view of okay, this like there's that bias of corruption. That it takes out that, you know, the standard refereeing in Africa is viewed as lower. I think that was one of the most important things to me with this tournament as yeah. well, is there was no refereeing controversy, which you seems which seems to happen in every other tournament. It didn't happen in AFCON. Were there calls no. that maybe you could say, eh, that probably wasn't the right one? Sure. But there wasn't anything that was like, no, this is blatant. <laughs> this is a blatant blown call kind of thing. Right. It's it's kind of almost for listeners who are probably listening to this 30 years ago. You're probably, I mean, 30 years from now, you're going to be like, what? What is he talking about the Super Bowl? Well, like the Super Bowl between Kansas City and San Diego, uh, Kansas City and San Francisco. 
it was like it was a game in which it was good, but I'm never going to think about like the ref making a call to change the decision of one way or another. Yeah, like the ref didn't make it about himself. Where we've seen before, VAR used in other countries, it becomes about the ref and his decision, and oh, we lost because of this. Like, no, you lost because you couldn't defend in the 15 minute. You gave up a crap goal. That's you lost because you couldn't make a penalty. Right, that's what you lost, not because of a hard decision, but yeah. Um, so we, that's the group stage. Now we get to like the knockout stage, and I, I swear, man, I think this is part of the reason why I don't bet on sports because <laughs> this is why I don't bet. Um, Morocco, I had them get into the semifinals, they get knocked out by South Africa, they act like they couldn't know how to attack. Senegal getting knocked out in the round of 16 to Ivory Coast, who shouldn't have been there for their coach a couple of days before. It's like, okay, this is weird. Egypt gets knocked out on penalties, and they look capitulated. And then Equatorial Guinea, the team that got that golden boot winner, gets knocked out. And I'm just like... And doesn't score a goal. (laughs) No! And I'm just like, every team who I thought was going to do it, or, or who I pick to do it doesn't. <laughs> and that's why I said DR Congo, they were my sleeper pick. I think they can do something. And they got to the semifinal. And you know yeah. what? I was very happy that they did that. But everything else was kind of like, okay, I wouldn't have expected, you know, if you had told me, okay, the semifinal is going to be Nigeria, South Africa, Ivory Coast, and DR Congo, I would have been like, Okay, how did how did we get here? Did Nigeria knock out a big team? They knocked out Cameroon. Okay, cool. You know, what happened to Egypt? What happened? It's like, no, Egypt lost to DR Congo. South Africa loses. South Africa knocked out Morocco. Okay, not expecting that. And then you're just like, oh, what about Ghana and Cam? Like, what about Ghana? Ghana doesn't get out of the group stage. Oh, Algeria doesn't get out of the group stage. And that's that was the fun thing with the uh, knockouts. It was kind of like. You had two big matchups in Nigeria and Cameroon, and then Senegal and Ivory Coast. Like, those were ones where most people would view it as okay, they're pretty balanced. And then all the other ones, it's kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen. You can tell me this team wins, and I'll believe you. Yeah. Like, there was like, what was it? Angola and Nibia. And I'm like, all right, Angola got a chance. They went through nothing, and they're playing against Nigeria. I'm like, all right, Angola's going to do this. Learn a whole Nigeria. Nigeria to me is the team where I was like, oh, they're not making you out of the group. Like they're gonna crap. They who I thought Ghana was gonna be. Hmm. Like they were <laughs> I thought Ghana was gonna be like, I mean, I thought Nigeria was gonna be there. And they figured out like, oh, if we play defense, we can make a run. Lo and behold, they do that. All the way to the final into the last couple of minutes where Ivory Coast, man, I, I don't think. Me personally, I don't think we will ever see another run again. Oh, I won't say it. we'll never see it. I'll let us say it. with Afcon. No, I don't believe that. Anything happen. <laughs> but it is highly unlikely that we will see a host nation who finished third in their group go all the way to the final and win. And, and I, I f- honestly. I would say it is. I think this is the saving grace for AFCON and Ivory Coast because we look, there's a whole different parallel where if Ivory Coast gets to the fi- doesn't get out of the group stage, right? Like, say if they don't win a game. Say if they draw their first game, it got to go through instead of Ivory Coast. The attendance for AFCON can just plummet. And it looks bad. And then you have all these stupid pundits making all these talking points about it, right? Just to gain the fact that the host country's out. I think it worked out great for the organizer. I caught it. <laughs> Ivory Coast goes on this run and plays another big power in Nigeria. Like, they get everything they want anymore. They got the small nations. I mean, I have some say small nations. The lesser known nations go on these amazing runs and capture the attention of everyone. The big teams kind of fall away to the wayside so that kind of hooks on the media and like what's going on with that. And then they get the final of a big power in Nigeria and Ivory Coast, the host nation playing each other. And it works out perfectly. And again, like I mentioned, Ivory Coast doesn't look good the whole time. 
And then they get to the final, and this, and it was all of a sudden like, where was this team the whole tournament? Like, they are dominating possession. They are putting in shots left, right, and center. They look very well organized. Where was this team the whole tournament? <laughs> just out of nowhere. <laughs> like, I remember sitting there, and I was just like, how did, like, I, I really thought once Nigeria scored, I was like, okay. Nigeria is now is going to settle in. Olsen is going to get a second goal. Nigeria is going to ride us off. And look, I will say this. Anamon Lookman, when he started off at Everton, there was a lot of problems. I remember he went to RB Leipzig, and then he came back. I, I want to say he went to Turkey. I think there was a Turkey uh, in there. No, he went to Fulham. I know he's – okay, Fulham, that's what it was. I was thinking about yeah. Shintas, but it's Fulham. And now I know he's at a at Atalanta, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. He's doing well there. He is. But like his stock, like I, I can make a legitimate I, legitimate. He was the best player of the tournament. He yep. was that guy. Like to me, he, he should have been the player of the tournament because so many of Nigeria's best moments came from just him creating and just like, even I, I remember Ultimate had a goal that was scored, but it got called back because I think Ultimate was offside or something. They're better about fouling the play. But Ultimate has like a pass and it's like, it's Kevin De Bruyne esque. Like the ball kind of like invades two, three defenders. And I, I remember he's in the right hand space and he's driving down his lane and he sees Ultimate in the left hand space kind of like drifting. So he whips his ball and just, the only way how this ball is going to get past the center back and the, right, and the left back is if it's low, but it curves. Mm-hmm. But it curves at that right moment where the goalkeeper doesn't come out, and he hits that pass. And it's like the only other player I know that can hit that pass right now in this game is Kevin Debrona. And he hit that pass perfectly. And that's just me. I think he should have been playing the tournament. But – well. I was going to say, one of the things you mentioned with Nigeria is they did look so defensively organized. And a lot of that was because of their captain, um, William Truce Ikong. So he was picked as the player of the tournament. I think that's the fair one because he had that Nigerian back line very organized. He had scored in (laughs) he scored in the final. He He almost like was able to get, you know, get that crowning achievement as well. But I, I think that was. I think that's probably why he got the player of the tournament, just because of how organized that back line was for Nigeria and how he was the one that kept it all together. And I mean, he he seemed to be everywhere most of the matches. So I I, I definitely understand with Lookman, but I, I think who with Drew Sekong, it made sense that he got it just because his impact um, was kind of one of those where you know if you take him out, I don't think yeah Nigeria doesn't get this far. Oh no. No, probably not. Probably not at all. I mean, to me, honestly, like, I think, I mean, we were saying it all day, but, like, the biggest talking point for me about Africa is there is a lot of talent in Africa that I think unfairly goes unrecognized because mm-hmm. a lot of people aren't familiar with it, and it's hard. It's it truly is hard to watch. And if you don't have eyes on it, you kind of just make generalizations. And Africa is a way to kind of see this talent and be like, oh, what's up? Like, there's some really skillful players. And to be honest with you, man, maybe not at the top elite level of like European football, right? But yep. if you're a USL owner or MLS owner or like in Austria or Switzerland or um, like the lower levels of France, I-, I will look at some of these players here, man, and be like, yo, there- there's some cheap talent out that we can get and, you know, get some good play out of it. Well, and I was going to say, one of the things, like, I feel like France is one of the few nations that really does look at Africa and bring in talent. I, I feel like France is kind of the main one that does it. I think Portugal does for certain nations, you know, when just because of that Portuguese aspect. So I know, like, Cape Verde and Angola, they're probably going to get more. Like, the Portuguese leagues are probably going to look more because it's also an easier language because they speak Portuguese over there. So I think yeah. for that that would make sense. Um, Equatorial Guinea, probably the same thing with Spain. Like, I think a lot of these lower leagues in Spain, in England, in France, 
they could be doing more. And I, especially with England, you would think like there's enough players that have that were born in England that have Nigerian parents that you can look and be like, okay, and you don't have to deal with work permits. So I, I think it is one of those where I think just because it's a little bit tougher because you have, I, obviously you have work permit rules and non EU restrictions, but that's why I think like the Netherlands and France where the, where the work permits and the registration rules to get on the roster are less strict. I think that's why it would be beneficial for them. And I think there's a club in, there's definitely a club somewhere in Scandinavia. I think it was in Denmark where they have like a partnership with like, Oh, an, uh, I've seen Noi- uh, noise. In it. Yeah. Matter of fact, our part owners of San Diego FC Chrome, RoboCop FC. There we go. So yeah, but like you, you know, you start maybe we'll start seeing more of that. You know, there's Generation Foot uh, over in Senegal, and they're able to kind of produce all these players and get them overseas as well. So I think that is going to be something that increases because yeah, there's enough. There is talent in this tournament. Like there are talented players that just haven't gotten the opportunity or just aren't getting noticed. Whether it's bias, whether it's scouting budget, whatever. Yeah. Um. So yeah, man. I think I think this is a good way to put a bow on F card. I mean, it was a fantastic tournament. Mm-hmm. Fun all around. Like, I don't think there was a bad game on TV. You know, you know how usually some tournaments there's like a game where you're like, all right, I don't need to watch this. Um <laughs> But I don't know games, that that uh group B finale, South Africa, Tunisia, N- uh, Namib- uh, yeah. Namibia, yeah. and Mali, those are pretty bad zero zeros. <laughs> like, there yeah, are definitely some was... matches where I was like, I don't know about this. The funny thing is, I think those were the only nil nils up until that point of the group stage. Um, I think the Congo had one as well, I just don't remember against who, yeah. I think I think if I heard the stat right, I definitely. I think Dear Congo yeah. and had what I had a zero zero in the group stage. I just can't remember, but there wasn't that many zero zeros. I think there. No, I know. I think there was maybe like three or four total. Yeah. But even so, that's still like good entertainment number. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, man. What are your lasting thoughts or impressions about Afcon this year? I think it's one of those, again, it's one of those tournaments where it's enjoyable to watch because there is the uncertainty. There is the unpredictability. There's a lot of talent as well. And I think the next one is going to be in Morocco. So that's another one where that could be very well attended. That could, And I think it's just like the overall aspect of not only the players, but the coaches, the fans, media, they're all genuine and you see that culture right at the forefront which is pretty great to see as well compared and not to say like the euros and you know copa don't have it but it's just not it's just not the same that you see when you watch the crowds in afcon yeah well it's like with copa and and euros is like you expect the big teams to get through Mm -hmm. right and it would be shocking if they don't like it would be really shocking but there's just also like a money disparity and talent disparity. Whereas like an AFCON, you gotta walk into it, you really don't know. But it feel like I would say out of all the international competitions, it feels like it is the most balanced from top to bottom. Yeah. Like there's gonna there's, there's still, gonna be another potential Cinderella that we just don't know about. Yeah, like there is a disparity, in, you know, between talent, right? But it feels like it is the most balanced between like the tops and the bottoms. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kyle, thanks for doing this podcast with me, dude. No problem. I'm glad to be on. Of course, I, I'm glad to talk about AFCON. And uh, again, if you're not watching it, you need to get on that next year. Yeah. Also, by the way, like, not for those who probably know, um, being sports also does. Uh, the African Champions League. So if you're looking for more African soccer to watch, watch that. Like that's also a pretty cool tournament. I think I watched it last year. I think I watched uh why what was it? Raja Ridad? A club in Morocco. They were in CONCACAF. I mean not CONCACAF. I keep saying CONCACAF. CAF Champions League. And it was pretty cool. Um okay. yeah. yeah. It was pretty dope. 
Um, so with that being said, listeners, um, make sure you check out our Instagram post, our Twitter post, as we do our Black History um, post this month. You know, we do it once a year. We've been doing it for the last four years. Um, so this month, this time this year, we're focusing on AFCON, so like some of the cool moments, the players, the coaches. Um, that's teams that played in men's and women's AFCON because we want to highlight both. Um, also, go to make sure you check out our website tomorrow because my friend Kyle over here wrote an amazing article that will be coming out shortly. So make sure you check that out. And uh, with that being said, just make sure you keep in touch with the socials. That's about it. Anything else from you, Kyle? Nope. I just appreciate being on and just make sure to continue following um, Can I Kick an FC and also any other well-run Black podcast content in general. Yeah. And don't steal other people's content. It's not cool. Well, don't steal it. But yeah, just do just your research. Google. Yeah, do your research. A Google search yeah. will save you a lot of trouble. Yeah. That's about it. Until next time, listeners, I'm about to go to sleep. I'm tired. Oh, sure. Thank you.